I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. This is Audio Gan, and I am your host, Kedar Nimkar. Welcome to a deep dive into the minds of luminaries from the Indian creative world. Today we have Hemant Jha with us on AudioGAN. Hemant is a principal and founder at Honest Structures, a Goa-based model of furniture company that designs modest yet highly functional and aesthetically pleasing products for both living and working. Previously, he was chief design officer at Godrej and he has been teaching at IIT Institute of Design and Kellogg School of Management in US. We'll deep dive into what makes design honest and how things can be designed keeping a long-term vision with respect to sustainability and more things as we speak to him. So thanks, Hemant, for giving your time and it's a real pleasure to have you on audio again. Kedar, it's wonderful to be here. Um, thanks for having me on board. Awesome. So I've sort of named the topic as Honest Structures itself. So to start, I wanted to ask you, like at a meta level or at a philosophical level, what's your definition of honesty? And then what is honest structures? Like how did that transpire? In Obviously in the design context. <laughs> right. So that's a, that's a lovely question, Kedar. Now, to be perfectly honest, when we were thinking about the company, I couldn't come up with a good enough name, right? And we went through a bunch of names and each one seemed kind of contrived, not really what we wanted to communicate. And what I could do was talk about the intent and what we wanted to do and who we wanted to do it for and what we would accomplish when we got things right. And a friend of mine that I was talking to said, well, it sounds like you're trying to make honest structures, you know, simple things that have integrity with which you can organize and enable. I mean, pretty fundamental stuff. And I remember thinking, Megan, you totally got it. I mean, that's awesome, right? I mean, that's it. Like, that's the name. And so that's how, it, that's how it came about. And broadly speaking, you know, for us, it's about doing the right thing. It's a constant conversation between me and Kopal. And Kopal is head of product design at, at Honest Structures. Anytime we're working on something new, on solving a problem or evaluating an idea, we ask ourselves, is this the right way? I mean, is this what we should be doing? And not surprisingly, it's actually quite easy to answer this question, right? Because all of us instinctively know what the right thing is. Now, if you think about the technical definition of honest, right? I mean, I was looking this up according to like Webster. It's something that is legitimate, truthful, genuine, real, reputable, good, worthy, right? They all mean the same thing within different contexts. And so that's that's kind of how the name came about. Mm. Yeah. So, but don't you think that if it's the right thing and if somehow a lot of people start doing that, would you think it will land up in being monotonous? I mean, this is to extend the question that then how do you define your design language, especially the, the aesthetic part of it? Or, or is there a different connotation only when you see design language for honest structures products? Okay. So, you know, I think it might be good to, uh, if I can just pull back a little bit to talk about um, sort of why we're doing what we're doing. Hmm. Right now, as you know, I've studied architecture. Um, I've kind of taught architecture and design. And I have, you know, for the last roughly 25 years, I've been sort of splitting my time between India and the US and other parts of the world, right? And I noticed after a while that every time I would travel to India, I would I would I would kind of see things. For example, you look at bottles and the labels are not always perfectly straight right? When you reach out to somebody, people may not respond on time. I heard so many people talking about, you know, buying products, they would think, well, the after sales service is really good. But they wouldn't really talk about, well, how good the product was in the first place. I mean, why should you need after sales service if the product itself is great, right? You know, I found spelling mistakes in legal documents, which, <laughs> which seems mm-hmm. kind of crazy to me. Mm. And so it's this everyday stuff that wasn't quite right. And it seemed to be everywhere, right? I mean, Gurgaon for the longest time where my parents live had no roads. And then we get roads and then the roads have no drains. And so every monsoon, the roads just fill up with water. And I would keep asking myself, you know, why this was. Because 
as a nation, India is one of the few countries in the world that actually makes pretty much everything that we consume, right? Mm. So from bulbs and bread and cement and cars and phones, I mean, we send missions to Mars, right? Which is, which is amazing. But we don't really seem to do this everyday stuff really, really well. And I feel that in many ways, we're probably not the best at anything in the world, right? And that bothers me because, you know, if you look back 2000 years ago, India used to be one of the three centers of excellence in the world. Metallurgy came from here, you know, textiles, paper, you know, timekeeping, like fundamental stuff. And so I kept looking for answers and I kept reading everything I could get my hands on. I would talk to everybody, and friends and designers and politicians and, you know, and taxi drivers. Now I'm talking to you. And I never got a satisfactory answer. And the other puzzling thing was that there doesn't seem to be an Indian design identity, right? So if you Mm. ask ourselves the question, what does it mean for modern design to come from India? I don't think there's a clear answer. There's a generally pretty good understanding of what American design is or what Scandinavian design is or Japanese design, right? You can tell that there's a deep connection to the culture, the people, and the attitude and the past, right? And the hopes and dreams for the future. But even though in India, we have a remarkable past in architecture and design, it's typically not manifested in a deep and meaningful way in the modern interpretation, right? And so we Mm. we either look to the past and we say, my God, we've done such amazing things, or we look to other places, right? And, you know, I caught myself thinking, what's up with that? And, And so finally, I felt that the only way to figure out if truly great sort of world-class modern design or stuff could come from India would be to just do it, right? I mean, a lot of people said, oh, it can't be done. There's no place for modern design in India. Banana mushkil hai, you know, people don't want to spend money, etc. I, I kept hearing all these excuses. And I said, you know, the more excuses that I heard, the more convinced I was that we could actually do it. And so HS was kind of a personal challenge. It was a test. Now, in terms of design language, what this means is that you know, we try to be true to ourselves. So having integrity from the inside out, right? It applies to how we think and how we design, how we work, how we treat people. And it was always our intent to create the cleanest and most responsible products in the world, right? We live in a time that is otherwise populated with excess. I mean, there is, you know, things are loud. There's a lot of surface level stuff, the stuff that tries to grab your attention at the moment, right? And we want it to be the opposite. So imagine something that is quiet, something that is solid and intelligent and meaningful. And I've always said that to us, it will feel like a success if you don't ever really see our products, but you're simply able to see what we enable. So we just kind of, you know, we're just in the background. And I think that would be the ultimate success of Honest Structures. So, you know, with that in mind, we don't really have an overtly prominent design language. It's just what comes from our approach and process. Um, We're not imposing a particular look on top of anything. Now, that being said, we do make very deliberate choices. So in terms of materials and finishes and manufacturing processes, maximizing efficiency and reducing waste, structural integrity and strength. So these are all fundamental aspects that are highly, highly considered. And then what is distilled from all of this becomes the design language that you see, right? So it's not styled, but it's definitely deliberate and considered. And I think that's what it means, to be honest. Wow, beautiful. I'll I'll come back to the point where you mentioned about um, having those sort of elements. And then I want to just understand, like, which section of that also you keep digging. But before that, uh, like, even I have seen, like, Dieter Ram's shelf program at a friend's place, and uh, you you uh, you said it very beautifully that you really don't see the the plates and the structure that is holding it, but you just see the objects directly, which are kept for display. Say like a book or like a toy or whatever TV or whatever it is. So I'm I'm totally inspired. But in India, despite me li- loving like Dieter Rams, I have you can see in the background a lot of wood. And and India we have this warmth. So two questions actually there. How do you arrive at the same comfort or the same calmness or same uh, touch which Indians love. Uh, And the second is, why sort of have that language also? Actually, we'll take in two parts. So first, I'll I'll ask the why part. Why have like one design philosophy or why there is something called as right and wrong? Uh, Because I'm I'm coming from that sort of contrarian or, or rebellious 
character of a designer ki why i even have that as a as a indian language so you know i i am um... I agree with you. I, you know, I really don't think that there is a right and wrong. Um, I think the design space or just the world of product or, you know, any of it, um, I think it's big enough to accommodate all of us. I think it would be an extremely sort of fascist or like um, really oppressive thing to do to say to somebody, look, this is how it's going to be because this is the right thing and this is how everyone's got to, you know, be and sort of this is how everyone has to live and behave. We would never do that. I mean, that would be, that would be so terrible. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, I think, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to say that there's a certain way that we do things. We don't expect that everyone's going to get on board with it. But, you know, if we sort of care about the same things, then chances are that you will like what we do. And so it's not for everyone, but for those who get it and want it, it's probably the best thing that you can get, right? Does that sort of address? Yeah, 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 I got it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, And then how do you sort of arrive at, we'll talk about the materials, but whatever I have researched, I think I just wanted to set the background that how do you arrive at that comfort or the calmness or the keywords that you mentioned in uh, in a physical object where in India, I think it's, it's still wood, being the predominant sort of furniture, if I may call it. Right, right. You know, I mean, I I agree that actually comfort is important for people pretty much everywhere, right? It's not just an India thing. And this is something that we've experienced pretty much anywhere we've spoken to anybody because everybody thinks, well, you know, steel is hard, but wood for some reason is comfortable. And if you think about like sitting on a chair or a stool, you know, compared to our bodies or our behinds, wood and steel are pretty hard. I mean, I would say they're pretty comparable in terms of hardness, right? Our bodies are, are, are a lot softer than either one of these materials. So it's not really about the material. I think it's much more to do with, you know, you look at something and emotionally, you know, how does it make you feel? And I think all of us have an association with wood um, that is much more comfortable and that's warmer and the association with steel is typically sort of industrial, maybe, right? We see automobiles, we see buildings made of steel, we see factories made of steel. And I think there's like a, there's something kind of working in our minds all the time saying that if it's steel, but, you know, it couldn't possibly be comfortable. Now, that being said, I think it's perfectly legitimate for somebody to come to us and say, dude, I can't live with something that's all steel. I need some wood. You know, I have a family, I have other people who are going to come to my place, I have, you know, it's like I need some wood. And so what we started doing is we we started doing that and we use wood in our own way. And we're not, you know, we're not making furniture that's all wood, but we've, we've combined wood with steel. So if you buy a table from us, we offer you the option of getting a tabletop in um, sort of a very nice birch plywood. Right, we don't really stain it or whatever. We let you see the grain of that material. It's also CNC machine, so it's super precise and it's very durable. But you know, there you have it. So there's like wood combined with it. We also use felt. So uh, India is a wonderful place to get wool felt. And one of the projects that we're just working on right now, and um, they loved the steel sort of stools and benches that we had, but they really wanted there to be a softer seating surface. Again, totally makes sense. And so, so we laser cut felt, and then we attach it magnetically to our steel products. And so you can kind of just snap it on, and you can pull it off if it gets dirty, and you can clean it or put some new stuff on later. And, and so with every project that we do, or almost every client that we speak to, there's usually some kind of input that comes from there, which we then incorporate into our collection going forward. And we're doing the same thing in, you know, India and the US. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of learning. And, 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 uh, and I think it'd be very arrogant of us to say, you know, this is it. Um, so we don't do that. Awesome. Yeah, I got I, I think that's a good segue for the next question because uh, when you said felt and when you said wood, that means being a designer, it's sort of like a continuously exploring journey. So, so at Honest Structures, like what do you think you keep like as a fundamental principle or what is that one thing that you try to strive for or achieve despite all the odds right Uh, be it just I mean there are multiple ways right and in the entire supply chain also there are thousand other pieces Um, so sustainability uh, versus making it sort of eco-friendly making easy to ship and assemble every piece is very critical 
but you might be having some sort of an anchor right i i i won't budge or i won't change this core philosophy no matter what happens so like what is that one or two sort of principles that you think you sort of don't are non negotiable that's a that's a great point and you know we it's it's also difficult to define because you're absolutely right that there are so many moving parts um especially yeah. when you're making a physical product right from the beginning we said that the products had to be and the cleanest and most responsible in the world now there are so many different ways in which you could interpret that uh, right and there's so many aspects of that um that you yeah. could uh, sorry uh, uh, sorry right. human sorry sorry to just interrupt again because i wanted to rearticulate the question and this happens to, to me a lot of times so whenever uh, keeping my steady job and sort of doing this project a lot of people ask how do you get time and i say if i have 5 hours and i can do marketing i can create social media post or i can do research for the next guest now in that context both are equally important for me as a project <laughs> but still i spend more time on say research or at least digging further into the project so that's that's where i'm coming from that you have this long sort of life cycle of building or or, or creating or designing a furniture in that context i wanted to see like where which fragments that you really deep into because everything will be important yeah i, I get that right so okay so the one common factor and we've been doing this only for about 3 years now but the one thing that really sticks out in my mind is that we are constantly refining our products so we have never stood back and said look this looks really good it's working for everybody and i think we're done um so i think the common thing across everything we do is that we never feel that we're ever done um so with every project or every installation we learn something and then we fold it right back into the collection that we put it right back and it's a wonderful way to work because it allows us to evolve quickly right it also means that we're not just doing this for ourselves we're doing it with other people so yes we you know we add new products to the collection in this way we take things out but most importantly i would say that we are constantly refining and minimizing so the question to ask is how do we accomplish even more with our products um how do we make them even more functional with even fewer moves and fewer parts and fewer processes and kind of even less drama right so um mm-hmm. so less is more that is something that we strive for constantly and it's tremendously exciting when you can accomplish really cool things with very few moves and there's this japanese audio brand that i really like it's called 47 lab and that tagline is only the simplest uh, can accommodate the most complex and you know as you know it takes extreme skill to make something fabulous with as little as possible right so the best cooks will do this right with like three ingredients they'll put together an, an amazing meal or the best artists or the best designers so it's magical when that happens so like that is that is the thing we strive for beautiful beautiful in fact even i remember two things uh, i had interviewed uday atwankar a professor from iit idc mumbai and uh, he used to give this challenge to students that design a game in 100 rupees and they used to design then used to say okay design the same game now in 50 rupees <laughs> and they used to design it and it used to go that abstract that now you design like assume it has to be done for like really really maybe poor or underprivileged kids so the same game has to be designed in 0 rupees and that's where you really abstract out and see what the essence of the game is and try to replicate that with say body movements or something like that so that one story clearly sort of like i could connect the dot key how how do you sort of yeah and the second is obviously our uh, hindustani classical it's just like one vocalist one tabla and like a one harmonium I think they can then they can create magic with like right. less is more concept yeah absolutely i mean it's it's completely mesmerizing yeah and yeah, uh, yeah it's fabulous when it happens yeah cool let's take a short break here we'll be right back hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network 
On Advertising is Dead, Varun talks to Naveen Murali. He is the head and VP of marketing at Pepperfry, and together they trace the evolution of the furniture market in India. On Marathi Kirki Tunde Deshmukh's welcome Sanya Mane, host of our new Marathi podcast, Akhand Bharat. She shares how she conceptualized the podcast and the story behind presenting history in this way. On Tere Mere Rasta, Hikesho takes us to a land of unique traditions, Mathi. Find out how they use auspicious occasions to plant trees. On Pulia Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh analyze India's current need of the hour, self-reliance or self-interest. And on Smarter with Sid, Siddharth shares two important lessons we can learn from the infamous Oscars incident involving Will Smith, Chris Rock and, well, a joke and a punch. Do follow us on social media. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on, including the one you're listening to us on now. And also, please do check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels. They're all available on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. We're also doing a small listener survey to help us understand you, the listener, better and how you like our shows, how you respond to the advertising, and so on. We I'd really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to spell it out. It's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, SBI Life Insurance, India Water Portal, and Jupiter, a digital banking app. Thank you so much for making this possible. Okay, welcome back to the show. So you you have, like, we have so many wide materials um and i guess honest structures has dealt with love obviously felt and and wood to a certain extent but predominantly it has been steel so why why or what made you land up on steel or a metal as opposed to like uh, plastic recyclable plastic seems to be the most agile most versatile uh, obviously if it's recyclable then it's it's friendlier as well it's greener but then why, what what made you land up in steel so with honest structure the goal was to create a global enterprise and at the same time keep it super super local or wherever in the world we're present right so um made in made in goa for india made in chicago for the us um in india we use 100% indian materials in manufacturing in the us we use 100% us materials in manufacturing right we're thinking of going to japan next and it'll be the same thing there right the product mix that we have across geographies is pretty much the same it's adapted to be suitable for regional preferences but it's mostly the same right now in order to do this mm-hmm. we had to look for a palette of materials and processes which would be available to us across the world um so basically the material needed to be mm-hmm. a commodity mm-hmm. right i mean that's what a commodity okay. is so it's it's more um, of a need rather than right so so it couldn't be and for the kinds of products that we do and for the needs that we serve it couldn't be too exotic or expensive um it had to be easily available it had to be easily recyclable and steel fit that bill right so in terms of strength and the feel like the heft of it um the availability um and steel is also an ancient material i mean it comes from a long time ago and like we said you know india was one of those centers of excellence thousands of years ago where alloys were first made and so and it's a it's a commonly available material right so there's something really nice about using a humble material and then showing what it can do now that being said we are constantly looking for materials that we can use specifically in different regions so for example here in the US we have access to a really nice flat tabletop material that's made of about 100 layers of paper and biodegradable resin and it's compressed under high temperature and pressure and it's really smooth and it's cool to the touch it almost feels like stone right and so we use that here but we can't really use that in india because the material i mean you know you don't get that in india but in india we can use unbleached wool felt for seating surfaces because that's what's available there so it's almost like the backbone of the collection is steel because we can use it anywhere and then we enhance that with other things that are region specific now to your point about um, plastic right we are totally totally open to using recycled plastic and the reason that you don't see it used more is because people don't realize how tough it is to recycle plastic cleanly and efficiently um mm-hmm. it sounds a lot easier than it is but because it's so difficult to do and different parts of the world either more or less kind of evolved or farther along on their journey towards doing it it is generally pretty unpredictable 
right? And I think this should totally be a topic for a different conversation because it's important to do, right? And we have looked into it um, pretty much everywhere that we have worked. And I would say this as an open offer to anybody who's working with recycled plastics. Like if you are looking for someone to partner with or someone to use the material that you're producing, you know, please reach out to us. I mean, we will be your first clients. So, so that's, that's sort of the long and short of it. I think as material science gets better, as things kind of evolve a bit, we will kind of always be there to kind of take it on. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, very interesting. So, so uh, if I have to just change gears a bit and talk about like scalability, uh, you, you like in your website and a bunch of places where I read, like can modular and plus customizable products uh, be scaled? I mean, I've seen uh, at least my exposure to furniture design in this sort of uh, uh, Jonna is is Dieter Rams, and uh, I've heard stories of they having like a like exclusive software. You can like take the photo of your wall, like wall and just send them. They will send you a plan immediately. Like really cutting edge stuff there. So uh, and they produce like industrial polish and plus mass produce. So do you think like these products which are sort of greener or or whatever you call them, honest, can be scaled up? Or, so, or they have to be designed as in like like have to be personalized and can personalized can't be scaled. So there's a trade-off there, right? So I, I love that we're having this conversation, by the way, Keda, because it's actually it, it, it's really good because we're getting to kind of the heart of the matter. So to address this question, I think let's go back to the time of the Industrial Revolution. Right. So we're going to about 1880 or so. So it's about 150, 200 years ago. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, all products were made by hand, right? So you had to make them one at a time, and it was time-consuming, it was expensive, a very few people could afford it. But the good thing was that because you're making it one at a time, and you're making for a particular client, everything was customized, right? So it was always customized perfectly to whatever the client or the person wanted. Now, the Industrial Revolution comes along, and now we have machines that can make things, right? I mean, this is the birth of mass production. So now we can make thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of things, right? But there's one caveat, that they have to be exactly the same thing. So we can make millions of one thing, but they can be plentiful and they can be cheap, right? Mm. So if you think about companies like IKEA, right, they have built their, I mean, that's what they're built on. Um, The idea of making things in massive quantities Um, But it's always the same thing, right? It's never customized because you can't customize it. Now, the crazy thing is that these companies that are still doing this today, they're using a process or an approach that was started by, that was started 150 or 200 years ago, right? So if you look at even something like fast fashion, you're mass producing things, which means that you're basically making so much that you're throwing out about 50% of whatever you produce, right? It's, It's kind of crazy today. So when you look at something like that, it becomes obvious that our problem today is not about having too few things. It's about having too many things, right? It's about Mm -hmm. overproduction and waste. So if you look around you, I mean, we don't really need more tables and chairs. We don't really need more t-shirts. We don't really need more cheap shoes, right? Yeah, yeah. and, and, but, But if you think about the organizational structure of companies, right? Companies are built on an idea. They're built on a certain way of doing things which is why massive companies like IKEA, and I don't want to single them out, but it's just that they're so incredibly prominent in this field. They're built on an idea and a certain way of doing things. And it's practically impossible for companies to change themselves from the inside out. I mean, they can't do that, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Because all their methods and their way of thinking and their materials and processes are based on a certain way of doing things. And how do you take all of that and say that's irrelevant and let's do things completely differently? It doesn't work. So traditional mass manufacturing is not effective at making a few things at a time or making things differently customized to different people, right? So they keep doing the same thing over and over again and over and over again. But if you look around you, as people, we're all different people. Um, we weigh, you know, we, we weigh, we're different weights, we're different body shapes and sizes. And now these companies are still telling us 
if we're only going to make one type of chair or one type of table and every it's everybody's job to somehow fit themselves into it, which I think is kind of crazy. That's not fair, right? So in this day and age, I think it's actually BS. It's totally possible to do things differently. So what we do is take advantage of absolutely modern means and methods. So we can produce millions of products and each product can be customized to who you are. So everything we do is laser cut. It's laser cut after you place the order. So we're never shipping from a warehouse that's filled with stuff. We use robotic processes for cutting and folding. So it's all super fast. Um, So if you look at our stool, we can cut the stool in less than 30 seconds. We can fold the stool in maybe a couple of minutes, right? And because we've built our approach on the idea of adapting and customizing, we can make your stool an inch taller. We simply adjust that in code. And the next stool that we cut on our laser is your stool. Right? It takes no more time to do your stool than it takes to do somebody else's stool. And so we don't even have to charge extra for it. So it's perfectly customized. It's mass produced in the fact that you know, we can make as many of them as you want. We can do it super fast. Um, but I think this is the approach that we need to take for our time. It's not about making as much of one thing as possible. It's about making things that are perfectly tailored to who you are as a person or who you are as a company or an organization. And today we can do that. Mm. I think I'm trying to sort of, yeah. You know, it's uh, the idea, it used to be called uh, mass customization at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, some people think of this as industry 4.0, right? That you can actually have very flexible manufacturing approaches where you don't have to stamp out the same thing over and over and over again. But your machines and processes are evolved to the point where you can make one thing today and you can make another thing tomorrow. Or you make a variant of one today and you make another variant tomorrow. And I think I think we are there now. I mean, that's what we're doing. Hmm. And, and in that, uh, in one of the interviews also, you mentioned that there's almost zero wastage or like as less waste as possible because you get those, finally, those sheets and uh, aluminum and whatever, the, the raw material will be still in a finite size, right? Say like five people want a stool in a particular size, the sixth one wants an inch more, there is less, like how do you handle that wastage or it doesn't happen? So you're right. I mean, there's there's always waste and we try to minimize it as much as possible. So if we use a sheet of steel, we will be as efficient as possible about placing the parts on it, you know, like a template, the way we want to cut them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes these, these arrangements get kind of crazy. But even then, you know, there is waste. Um, waste as in there is material that's left over from the cutting. Now, the nice thing about using a single material and using something like steel is that it's actually quite easy to recycle. There's a really massive market all over the world that will simply buy the leftover bits of steel that you have. They will melt it down and remake it into more sheets that you can use. That's another thing that was really critical for us, that we would never use the idea of mixed materials. So if you have a single material and it has no welds, it has no other stuff that's been done to it, then it becomes very easy to reprocess it again into that same material. And so that's another philosophy that we kind of continue through the through everything that we do. Interesting. Interesting. I, I don't know whether, uh, but yeah, I'll have a plug here. One should listen to the 100th episode of Balakrishna Doshi and where I ask, uh, like, how has RCC changed uh, the, the landscape uh, of cities? And he almost in a I, I obviously he's is the legend so he can shout but he said <laughs> what is rcc to do with uh, design rcc is just a tool uh, and uh, we should know how to use it right so it is just it's just like another material like plastic if you can't use it well why blame the material itself <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh, i and, remember uh, you know you're right and I, I have listened to that episode and i think i think he makes an excellent point right yeah. Um, it ultimately, I don't think there's any such thing as a good or a bad material. It's just about what you do with it and kind of picking the right material, the right tools for the job. Yeah. Cool. My second last question is sort of, um, you, you in your website, it's also mentioned guaranteed for life. Now that's, I mean, I'm really proud uh, and and wish you all the best to have that sort of philosophy. But how do you sort of come to terms with it when the world is moving towards very like 15 second videos. In fact, I have a lot of furniture in my house, which is teak. 
बट वेन आई वॉज डिजाइनिंग एट लॉट ऑफ फ्रेंड्स एंड इवन द फर्नीचर गाय टोल्ड मी सर पंद्रह साल में बदल दोगे लाइक पाइन ले लो क्यों चाहिए टीक एंड आई सेट नो वर्स लाइक इज नॉट अबाउट लाइक चेंजिंग इट्स अबाउट हैविंग इट फॉर लाइफ और और एटलीस्ट टिल आई एम अ लाइव राइट लाइक वॉट गोज इन योर माइंड एंड एट द टीम एट ऑन स्ट्रक्चर्स वे दे आर सॉर्ट ऑफ कमिटेड टू डिजाइन समथिंग because designing for life is a super difficult task right you have to be like ultra minimalistic or something something i don't know whereas the demand on the other side is something else so what what keeps you sort of focused to build that longer shelf life so you know in terms of i mean if i were to pull back the design language um aspect that's one of the reasons that our products are not highly stylized right because if something is extremely sort of stylish on one day it's going to go out of style the next day right and then it becomes obsolete i mean you you know again you look at fast fashion i mean that's kind of what happens so it is a very purposeful um sort of effort on our part to keep things as straightforward and as honest again as as possible right now precisely because things today are so transitional and so transactional that's kind of the reason that we are taking the opposite tack disposable culture is a problem right because there are obvious major real world crises that that this creates I and mean, if you look at waste right there's so much waste from clothing from packaging from manufacturing i mean you can look at i mean there's there's garbage piled up everywhere in fact there's this this massive garbage dump in bombay that is so big that they actually have their own firefighting crews they have fire engines up there to put out the fires from the methane that's generated from just that dump imagine i mean that sounds like it's it's its own city or its own village or its own town i mean it's madness right it's absolute madness and so i think it's there's something really reassuring about para that are made with integrity right which you can repair and refurbish which are not designed to be obsolete in a few years your teak furniture for example that can be passed on multiple generations will use it right nothing will go wrong with it and in a way that's that's an that's an heirloom right and i think it'd be pretty cool to see hs stuff become you know kind of the heirlooms of our time yeah yeah i remember one uh, meetu akali i think uh, i had she is a goa based uh, interior designer and in in that episode i said uh, i was i was doing this furniture for my house and uh, one of the interior designer friends he said why don't you like put like ply and i'll give you a very teak finish <laughs> vinyl <laughs> to put on it so nobody will ever know and i said it's not about nobody will know it's about me knowing that it is not that <laughs> and i think that's where these honest sort of word really resonated and 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 feels nice about it that you know what you're building you know what you're sort of giving out in the society or or in in the community and uh, you you take that ownership and responsibility of how, like what will happen to it few years down the line or many years down the line so you know i mean to that point i have to there's this when we were starting out we were looking for coatings to put on our products and right from the beginning we said well we're going to use the highest gloss levels that we can find right um, or that are made and in the industry you kind of there's something like a 90 plus gloss level or 93 plus gloss level it doesn't really get much more glossy than that and everybody would come to us and say sir ab itna gloss level kyun lena chahte hain because pretty much everybody else we supply to they like to use matte because when you have a matte finish it doesn't reflect light efficiently therefore you can hide imperfections so if your steel below is not perfect or if it's wavy wo dikhega nahi kisi ko and mm. so that becomes so much better and we were it was exactly the same thing kid we were like look it doesn't really matter you know what other people are doing and what they're trying to hide or not show what i mean this is what we do and in fact we would love to be able to show how well this stuff is done so we can actually celebrate this but i think it it'll you know it will change i think if you keep doing what you're doing and we keep doing what we are doing and there are more people who say no to teak finish vinyl covering i think things will get better for everyone yeah absolutely wonderful wonderful 
So Hemant, I wanted to conclude with one last question, which is sort of a more application oriented uh, stuff and, and feel free to have a plug also, whatever you think. But which uh, domain do you think will benefit maximum from these sort of structures that you're building? Be it because uh, I, I was looking at like there's hospitals and then there is cafeterias. And so any, any thoughts uh, that you have identified so far that these are the domains or these are uh, areas where honest structures or or the, the 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 furniture that you have designed the products that you have designed using these honest materials will be helpful and in the long run will also be green for a lack of a better word so we um, in a way, we started out designing these products for ourselves, right? The way that we live or the way that we would like to live. And we always felt that there would be other people like us as well, obviously. And so it would be for this entire group of people who kind of believed in the same things that we believe in. We also wanted the products to be as useful to as many people as possible. And so they want very particular types of things, right? So they their stools and benches and their shelving systems and their everyday things that everybody can use in all types of situations. So the way I, I describe it to people is that if you think of a Lego, like everybody, everyone's played with Lego, right? And it's a bunch of little rectangular pieces and whatnot. And everybody can take those Lego pieces and put them in together into something that is theirs, right? And so if you had to build a house with Lego, you can build a house, you can do a car, you can do all sorts of things. So think of our approach as being a system with which you can do many different things. And so that being said, there's there's really no particular application that they were designed for, but they're designed to work really well across multiple applications. Um, So when we talk about hospitals, um, I think a product would work really well because they are extremely easy to clean and to keep clean, right? So if you had to sanitize them, you could literally take a product and put it in an autoclave or you spray it with chemicals or you wash it with soap and water and it's perfectly fine. Like nothing bad will happen to it. But then if you look at an application in a cafe where you also want to keep things looking clean and, you know, and sanitized, well, it obviously works over there too. And if it can work in a hospital in a cafe, then it can definitely work in, you know, a kid's room. So if they spill their, you know, their drink on it, no problem. So there isn't a particular um, kind of application. It's almost like a way of living or depends on what our priorities are. And if it kind of matches with that, then our products will work for you. Awesome. Cool. I think uh, these were the few questions. Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm, I have like a bunch of questions which we'll take offline. But uh, this is uh, it. You want to add anything about like honest structures? Uh, if people have to follow you, order so i think people can find us online right so just go to our website you can reach out to us through there and we can we can talk one of the things that um i think i'd like to share especially if there are people who are starting out or young designers or students one of the things that i have learned over time and that i really subscribe to is that just because something has never been done doesn't mean that it cannot be done and it definitely doesn't mean that it should not be done Right. And I think especially if something's never been done, um, for those who are willing to put in the work and the effort, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. So I have definitely enjoyed kind of taking this chance, like honest structures was a challenge for us, right? We didn't know if it could be done, Uh, but then we did it and it feels great. And so I would encourage pretty much everybody, or really I would encourage everybody to go ahead and do it. I think it's the best kind of experience there is. Great. I think that's that's a good note to end this. Thanks, thanks, uh, Heyman, for giving your time. And all the best for your Honest Structures long uh, life. And uh, yeah, happy to have you. And thanks, Kedar. I mean, I, it, was, it was lovely having this conversation. And, uh, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think it's, it's essential and fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it from today's Gyan session. For show notes and more GAN, visit audiogan.com. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to check our other interesting podcast on IVM Network. You can listen to us on IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or any of your favorite podcasting apps. 
to stay tuned follow us on twitter and instagram at ivm podcast and if you wish to connect with me i am at audiogan moments on instagram until then take care बहनों अपने सतत काम भणतर रसोई अन्य कामों में व्यस्त होइए छे अने आ बद्दा मा अपना जीवन ना एक महत्वपूर्ण तत्व ने भूली जाता होइए छे फाइनेंस इतले हमें तुम्हारा माटे लाव्या छे एसबीआई लाइफ प्रस्तुत एक चुस्की फाइनेंस एक पॉडकास्ट खास महिलाओं माटे जेमा हूं प्रियंका आचार्य एक फाइनेंस एक्सपर्ट तुमने शिकवीश के अपना पैसा सरलता से के मैनेज करवा अने आप पॉडकास्ट गुजराती अने अन्य सात भाषाओं में उपलब्ध छे। तो ट्यून इन करो दर मंगलवारे आईवीएम पॉडकास्ट नेटवर्क अने अन्य पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफॉर्म्स पर। Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta, and I'm host of the Paisa Paisa podcast. And I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday on the IVM Podcast app or the website, or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you, folks.